Sometimes you eat the bar. Sometimes the bar eats you. Yeah. That's right. I would guess those are cormorants. They look like it. Goofy looking birds, very ungainly. Yeah, they really are. And there's about four species of cormorants, so you never know which ones they are until you look at the identifier of identifying marks. What are those identifying marks? Do you know off the top of your head? Um, some brownness on the throat might would, in other words, the, the, the most common one is double crested cormorant, which is what we have yes. around here. Right. Mm -hmm. But you go on the coast, you, you go like the California coast, there's a uh, two or three other species. And then there's the great cormorant that's can be found up near the great lakes. And it's, it's like a foot longer. They're huge. If you really want to know, I can look at my book while we're chatting here. Yeah, you might as well. I won't charge you for my singing, okay? That was that was almost yodeling, but not. <laughs> All right, there's a one, two, three, four, five, there's six of them. The uh, the most common one is, is a double crested cormorant. They all they they cruise before they land, like they're like they're coming in like a seven forty seven before they land. The uh, great cormorant is is east coast only. The neotropic cormorant is primarily down towards Mexico and the Gulf. Double crested cormorant is in every state. There's something called the Brant's cormorant. They're like a greenish color, and they're the entire West Coast up to up to Alaska. Then there's a pelagic cormorant that's up up at Alaska and all the way up towards Russia. And then there's a red faced cormorant that's south of south of Alaska. So I thought the I thought the neotropics were going to be around you know the Arctic Circle. You know, um, the it's, a, it's a bad uh, joke. It's a bad joke. It's a, yeah, it's a bad one. Yeah, for sure. Nope, they're found uh, basically the Texas coast all the way down uh, to the tips of uh, Cancun, down to the Caribbean. And why why these guys would name it the Neotropic Cormorant is a mystery to me. And then. Then there's a, a, a product, and not a product, a similar uh, animal called an anhinga. Mm, weird and looking bird. There, the anhingas are, are seen in uh, Arkansas. I saw something a few weeks ago. I saw something a few weeks ago that there was they had found a nesting colony uh, uh, somewhere in southeast Arkansas. What is it they're looking for out in those fields? Basically, they're looking for the, the waste grains and the wheat and barley that they plant in the fields. And they'll, they'll also look for the wild plants along the White River Valley adjacent to Lund. Uh, and they'll feed on the tubers and roots of those plants. But they particularly like the uh, waste grains and the cultivated crops that are planted there. They normally come through on their spring migrations in the early February, March uh, period. And they'll stay in Lund for about a month to a month and a half. Um, and they'll leave about mid-March, maybe sometimes late March, but it tend, they're pretty consistent on a year-to-year -year basis. And where is it they'll go from, from here on their migration route? They'll go to their breeding grounds in northeastern Nevada along the Humboldt River and riverine sections. They also will breed in the southern tip of Idaho as well as the northwestern corner of Utah. I understand they're very long-lived animals. Yes, they uh, live about 20 to 25 years, and the pair 
will mate for life. And they're also one of the world's oldest living birds. Uh, their fossil records date back about nine million years. They seem so uh, vulnerable out in the fields. How do they protect themselves from coyotes and other predators? Well, during the day, they, they're real keen eyesight and they will fly as soon as anything gets close. Um, but it, at the evening when they roost and they roost on the ground, they're susceptible to the predators such as coyotes. And they're a formidable animal because the crane has a large beak and a long neck and they can bring it back quite a ways and, and they'll protect themselves. I was amazed we could hear them from so far away. Is that used for any particular purpose? Yes, they, uh, they'll actually communicate to each other with their call and they'll s establish a pair bond between the male and the female by that call. And they, they tend to do it in the spring, when the, right before they're becoming reproductively active. And the call, usually uh, many people will hear the birds before they see them because the call comes from the gut and it's a very loud, distinct call. You, you can't mistake it at all. Hey everybody, this is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance. And today is uh, On the Wing with Dan George and Kent Martz. And they're gonna be talking about uh, migratory paths and the science of, uh, that's being applied towards migrations, bird migrations. Of course, there's other things that migrate, but um, uh, Kent, I'm gonna turn it over to you and Dan. Hi everybody, hey Dan, how you doing? I'm doing fine, Kent, how about you? I'm good. So uh, we'll get started. I'm going to share my screen. We're going to start out the same, but we're going to have a different 180 degrees than what we normally do. Normally, we're looking at birds and listening to calls and stuff, but I find this subject fascinating. And, you know, there's been a history of uh, uh, radar being used to uh, uh, predict, you know, to, to watch birds, but it's really become an interesting science. And, uh, it's developed into its own discipline called aeroecology. And so here's a picture of, uh, by Terry Stanfill of a flight of mallard drakes and a hen, a single hen, which is uh, directly below the word aeroecology. Uh, I thought it was appropriate to uh, use a flight of birds in the air to talk about air ecology. Um, so we're also talking about something called Reno, Reno, radar ornithology, which is bird watching with radar. So, going to get into it. Aeroecology, aeroecology is the study of birds and other airborne life forms uh, and created a new ecology. Uh, if you think about it, many birds spend a massive amount of their time in the air, in the air, and it can be considered a separate form of habitat. Uh, the use of weather radar has revealed an unseen phenomena, the magnitude of birds um, doing nighttime migration. Uh, researchers were initially skeptical of the numbers people were showing uh, by using radar, uh, but good research uh, produces, uh, proves a massive number of birds migrate at night, mostly unseen and unheard. Obviously, we most of us have heard uh, snow geese migrate, especially in the central United States at night or Canada geese migrate. You can hear them from a long ways off. But the smaller birds, the songbirds, you can't hear them when they're 3,000 meters in the sky. They're just invisible and they're up there. Um, the clues of the mass migrations have sort of been seen, uh, especially around cities with large skyscrapers uh, by counting the number of birds that are visible. And here is, a small sampling of 226 birds collected by Melissa Breyer on September, the, the morning of September 13, 14, so the morning of the 14th, uh, before dawn, she went walking around the World Trade Center complex and she picked up the carcasses of 226 birds that she could get to. She noted that uh, in, in a tweet that others had been swept up uh, or were inaccessible because they were on roofs that she couldn't get to, uh, or they were so mangled she didn't want to collect them. Um, so 
she said that noted there were many more on, on roofs of lower buildings she couldn't get to. Here's another picture of a uh, assortment of the birds. Um, all of them songbirds um, that uh, flew into brightly lit buildings. And Dan and I were talking earlier, and I didn't think to, to put this in there, it's too late, but there was some uh, testing done and they turned lights off on skyscrapers uh, and went from being dead birds to no dead birds. The light is the emitted by the skyscrapers is the deciding factor in large building collisions um, because they fly towards the light. Um, and, you know, you've seen, we've all seen pictures of, of big cities with the skys skyscrapers lit up at night. The part of the goal of what's going on here is um, to do some forecasting uh, through a group called BirdCast. And BirdCast predicts um, mass migration events and encourages cities along that path to turn out the lights in the skyscrapers as much as possible to cut down uh, on the uh, um, number of birds that, that are killed in these collisions. Um, the map is pretty interesting up here in uh, uh, Wisconsin. You can see uh, a storm front in gray, right? And there's a storm front down here along the Gulf Coast. And the heat map in South Texas shows that there was a, a mass migration predicted to go on. The uh, algorithms, the machine learning predicted 267 million birds predicted to be migrating in the United States that night. Um, so this is a quick thing. So let's talk about the history of bird casting. Um, the efforts by this group began in 1999 with funding from the MPA, EPA that ended in 2001. Their goal is to maintain a website with information, predict and, modern, and monitor migration on a daily basis using weather radar, uh, collect information from volunteers, ground truthing, which is sort of what we saw from those bodies of dead birds, and raise public awareness about the sensitivity of migratory birds to light pollution. In 2020, 2010, Cornell University in Oregon State, uh, ornithologists and computer scientists proposed a research project and development uh, using advanced machine learning to create the new birdcast. The problem was they were having to get a massive amount of data and they just couldn't reduce it quick enough. A grant from the National Science Foundation created the program uh, 20 through 2016. It has since been continued and continues to this day. Um, in 2018, BirdCast began providing forecast and migration maps that visually show the grandeur of bird movements on a continental scale. And that's what we're looking at. Um, billions of birds migrate each year. Uh, the ability to predict the peak time and locations of these events greatly improves the ability to reduce building collisions. Uh, two researchers, Van Dorn and Horton, used radar and atmospheric condition data to predict the peaks and the flow patterns across North America. Their models predicted with very high accuracy the pattern of migrations at altitudes between zero and 3,000 meters as much as seven days in advance, uh, which allows the ability to say, okay, on these nights for this week, turn the lights off and help the birds. Um, here's an interesting, uh, this is from October 16th, 2017. You can see the weather along the eastern seacoast and up in the very northwestern United States. Everything else you see are birds beginning to migrate three hours after dark. And you can see the flow of darkness go over the United States. It starts in the east coast. And you can just see how the weather radar lights up at night. It's all birds. Every bit of that is birds. And with the creation of We'll talk about that in a second. So anyway, moving on. This all started back in World War II when radar became ubiquitous and it showed much more than airplanes. They noticed phenomena they couldn't really explain and they called them angels due to, due to their transient nature. Uh, in trying to understand what was going on, researchers began to hypothesize the birds were causing the phenomena 
Thus began radar ornithology. Next Red Radar, which came on along in the uh, 1990s, uh, boosted the available data because it was able to produce so much more information than standard radar had before. And in 2013, dual polarization radar opened the door with the ability to determine sleep from rain and also birds from rain, birds from insects, birds from bats, and combinations of both. Fascinates me that birds and bats, you'd think are the sort of the same thing, but they can tell a difference in them because of the way they fly. Fascinating that this is all out there just because of weather radar. And, it, and I have an app on my phone that is amazing. It takes the feed straight off the weather service. I can see how many, how much water there is a cubic meter of air. I can see how big the raindrops are. I can see how big the hailstones are. It's truly fascinating what is available. And this application in a unique way is, is pretty cool. Um, and this is, this really is amazing. On the night of July 25th, 2017, an estimated 50,000 purple martins roosted for the night in Oklahoma City. When the birds took flight the next morning, it's amazing what they were able to see. Here we go. Did you see that bloom right there in that dot right there? And you can just see them taking off to migrate north. So then at nightfall, the flock landed and just amazing that they were able to see 50,000 purple martins take off in uh, uh, Oklahoma City. Just mind boggling to me. Okay. So the maps predict nocturnal migrations begin three hours after local sunset and they update every six hours. So interestingly, the birds don't immediately migrate, apparently, as soon as it gets dark. They begin to migrate a few hours after dark. And this forecast is based on 23 years of bird movement detected by NEXRAD. Now, they also use the global forecasting system, which is a weather platform, that you, and they will use it to predict conditions that are suitable for migration. So as we showed a minute ago, grayscale on the maps show participation. So uh, to give credit where credit's due, Van Dorn and all, and all um, uh, created the forecast map image, uh, generation date, I didn't put the generation date. Yeah, there is, date downloaded, 9-22-21. So these are, I downloaded them yesterday. This is, a migration map for September 29th. And it was at 1805 Eastern time. Clearly, you can see it's, you know, moderate migration according to the heat map on the right where white is the hottest and medium is uh, about what's going through the central United States with low on the perimeter. Um, the wind on September 22nd in Arkansas, which was yesterday, was predominantly out of the north. Thus, birds attempting to migrate south want all the energy help they can get, and thus, they fly with the wind. So, and Dan and I were talking earlier, you know, these birds that are flying out due south over Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama, they're not hugging the coast, are they, Dan? Well, I'm actually... They are not because a lot of these birds that are migrating that, that include those coastal areas are actually on their way down to Mexico. So they, they actually migrate, continue their migration across the, the, the Gulf of Mexico. Which um, is an astoundingly exhausting flight, I would suspect, for many well, birds. What, what, I know is, what I know basically about fall, this is fall migration, right. is that there are many places during the course of those few days <clears throat> that takes, you know, it might take them one day to go through two states and then they'll, they'll bed down, they'll gain more energy, they'll, they're hi they'll hydrate and gain more energy because they need energy even with a south wind, I mean a north wind, they still need to have that help for their migratory trip down south. And it, 
in, in, in the birding world, as, as you were noting, you know, we're talking about fall migration here, which is typically not a, a, a prime birding migration time. Lots of birders uh, look for the spring migration, correct? That is, in fact, that's correct. As we were chatting earlier today, my experience as a bird watcher uh, it peaks around, uh, let's say, middle of March to, uh, the, to the middle of May, because that's migration of the songbirds primarily uh, from Mexico and places south of that all the way into and, and right around the east coast of Texas and right over uh, Louisiana and Mississippi. And in fact, my experience has been is that uh, you could come uh, uh, any morning, let's say, say probably May 15th or April 1st in that range, and you can find hundreds of dead birds right on the coast. They made it all the way across the coast, all the way across the Gulf. And those that couldn't make it died and perished because they were either exhausted, didn't have enough energy, and I doubt in those cases, light pollution had anything to do with their failures. Right. Uh, I think the light, the light pollution, I look at it as this, the light pollution compounds the natural losses. You know, and you could argue where, when they left, you know, did habitat destruction cause them to not be able to fuel up enough, but their internal clocks said, today's the day to leave. The wind is favorable now's the time to go and they just went and just didn't make it um, especially if especially if the wind is right you know these wonderful creatures know when it's time to migrate but if they're going into a headwind they will wait until the winds are favorable and it's it, this almost reminds me of that phrase survival of the fittest you know, not all, not all of those migrating songbirds are going to make it across the Gulf in, in March, April, May time. Um, but the interesting thing here, Kent, is that, for example, if, if, if we're looking at Orioles, you know, most of those mm -hmm. Orioles are actually in Mexico during wintertime. And, uh, and, but, for example, I have been in, in a place in Mississippi where there was like 40 male Baltimore Orioles. Can you imagine that? There, there are, I have in friends. Tree, dripping yeah. with orange. and yeah. It's unbelievable. I have friends here who put out uh, orange halves and yeah. grape jelly uh, and around their bird feeders. And they'll get a picture of 20 or 30 male Orioles and, and a requisite number of females packing their feeders and gorging on oranges. And some of these people buy bags and bags and bags so they can just keep putting them out and go through gallons of grape jelly for a couple of weeks while the migration is going on. The additional point to this whole thing is that they don't come independent of each other. They come in huge flocks of the same species. Right. And they'll, so, and they'll, and they'll migrate together. And then maybe in a week or two or three, a different species of a warbler will decide it's their turn and then they come all together. You know, my, my grandma in Gentry, Arkansas, uh, had a purple Martin house in her backyard. And I, it seems like she had 20 apartments and she would just sit out there and just talk to the, to the purple Martins and they'd talk to her and they literally were the same purple, purple Martins year after year. She was so excited, you know, when she saw the first scout show up and, uh, I've heard stories of people who scouts showed up and then it turned a terrible cold spell and they took the purple Martins into the house until the cold spell was over to try and give them a chance to survive. You know, so I don't know if it works or not, but on the night of September 22nd, um, last night, BirdCast predicted, well, let's say 80 million birds would be migrating in the United States. This is amazing. Okay. So that was last night. Okay. This was the night of September 21st, um, the day before, okay? September 22nd, September 21st, more than half a million birds were migrating in the central United States. And if you notice, look what happens. There was a series of lows right here on this gray. Lows are turning counterclockwise. Strong southerly or, you know, southern 
strong winds out of the north, fired this up across the whole middle United States. Just an astounding image of the difference one night makes, right? Um, and this has enough data to be pretty solid what's going on. And, and interestingly enough, look around the whole United States. Only in a few areas is there low migration. There are pockets all over the country where there's migration going on. But, you know, down through Nebraska, Kansas, Arkansas, Missouri, Illinois, uh, Indiana, up into Michigan, Minnesota, just astounding the movement of birds that was going on. And, you know, project that up into Canada. So, you know, we're talking about also. Go ahead. You can also see here that uh, the central flyway is obviously where the most of the mig migratory action takes place. If you look in the uh, from from Washington all the way to California, that's considered the Pacific flyway. You know, migration is still a factor, but the majority of them are maybe going from Washington down to Southern California, but maybe not down to Mexico. And over on the way on the East Coast, the Eastern flyway. Uh, it's it's really not an, uh, it's not a big factor. So what what actually happens in the springtime, for example, the the, the, the migratory birds that are going to be filling the entire fifty percent of the of the of the of the, of the nation, they're going to they're going to enter in Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi, and they all then they will fan out all the way up to Maine for those that that go actually mate up in Maine because they're going to go on a journey to where they're going to have their um, uh, my, uh, make their babies, you know, to nest and, and have children, have babies. And up in little the boreal, bird, little tiny birds. Yeah. And up in the boreal forests of Canada as well. You know, That's the, exactly, the you boreal bet. forests and the tundras of Canada are huge bird factories, not just for waterfowl, but for many other species of birds as well. So case in point, I happen to know it, like in Colorado, one of the most fantastic birds, um, um, hawks that we see in the summertime is the Swainson hawk. What a beauty. Check it out. And when you have nothing else to do, look at Swainson hawk. It's so incredibly beautiful. But you know what? It winters in Argentina. Um, Think they, about they that. Like seven, they, they, they migrate 7,000 miles. You know, it's just, and they do it without anybody telling them how to do it. They That's just exactly they just innately know what's going on. Okay, so looking real quick. So here's the night of the 22nd. So we're going to go 21st, the night of the 22nd. So I'm going to hop forward. I got these out of order. Uh, should have done them a little bit better. And here's what's going on on the night of September 23rd, which happens to be tonight. So notice how that front has pushed <laughs> off, and you're getting a whole lot going down through Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia. Uh, slightly different, but still uh, over 400 million birds predicted to be migrating tonight. And I think this is interesting up here in uh, the, the Dakotas, Nodak and Sodak. Um, there's a interesting little push coming down. I wish I knew what kind of birds those would be. And um, I meant to check today to get a prediction map for the 24th and forgot to, it'll be interesting to see what that looks like on the next night. Um, you know, what, where the, where that patch of birds are going to go. There was a time back when I was a fairly new birder for my first 10 years, I would keep track of when I would find a migratory bird land in the Denver area. And I would, I would mark the date. And then over the course of the first, the next five or 10 years, I'd say, for example, a, broad-tailed hummingbird is going to show up on the 21st of April every year, okay? But the rufous hummingbird was here on April 1st. So they all have their own individual intelligence as to what day they have to start migrating. It's all different. They're all different. They don't all come at one time. So what you're seeing here in Nodak and Sodak up there, you're seeing another species that maybe started in Canada a week ago or two weeks mm -hmm. ago, whereas a lot of your other birds have been gone already for a month. Right. And, you know, we're still looking at all the ducks and geese that are up in the, the upper Midwest and up in Canada. Yeah. 
have not even started yet, and they won't for months on end, a few months yeah. anyway, really getting into uh, November and December before those big migrations of uh, large waterfowl uh, begin to take place. So just, I love this stuff. I I, I could I, I could I could spend all day reading every word on this website, you know. So you're turned uh, into a bird watcher, buddy. What can you I know, say? I always have been because my parents on back for you for you young pups out there don't know what a Sunday drive is. We would take a Sunday drive and drive around um, the back roads uh, in the Ozark National Forest around Clarksville, Arkansas, and Dad would look for birds. And so, you know, uh, and that's one of the things I've kept. I've, I got rid of most of his books, but I kept one of his bird books where he had written dates of uh, uh, birds that they saw. And, uh, you know, it's just a cool little something and has no value other than sentimental. But, uh, um, you know, grew up, you know, bird watching. And, and it was one of those things that sort of goes by the, goes by the wayside. Uh, and my astronomy went by the wayside for a while. And then, Paul and Kathy Anderson rekindled that. And now uh, Scott and you have rekindled bird watching for me. I, I literally, I said this before, most nights I go home and I'll sit out in the backyard and listen to the birds and go, I know what that is. I know what that is, you know, and, and, and working on my identification. So that's good. That's good. So it's, it's killing me. I have another hobby. So, uh, oh. but, you know, no, it's not killing me. It's awesome. <laughs> so anyway, moving along. All right. Local bird migration alerts. BirdCast has a tool. If you go on birdcast.info, uh, they have a migration tool you can put in um, and with your zip code and get my direct migration alerts. Um, the point of this uh, is to uh, employ real-time data analysis and bird traffic uh, to determine whether birds are migrating in your area they want to provide timely information of nights of high intensity, otherwise referred to as peak migration, uh, only a handful of which occur throughout a given season. This allows effective targeting of the most important migration nights in the season, helping to determine when to act for maximum effect for conservation, such as turning off lights when birds are flying at night to avoid luring them towards artificial light and potentially fatal hazards. So, the goal, and I have been seeing uh, a few of these, some of my friends around the country have, uh, I think there's greater awareness has come to this in the last few months, because I had never seen this before, but in the past month or two, I've seen friends sharing um, Lights Out Houston. There's, a, you know, there's actually a program, uh, I think, called that's called, I believe it was Lights Out Houston, trying to get people to turn off their lights, and they're not saying on every night, they're just saying, turn the lights off at night on these one or, you know, six or seven day intervals when that peak is going on to affect the most birds possible. Now, it would be hopeful that they could learn that those skyscrapers don't have to have all those lights on all night long. They can get by without it, but light is part of, you know, people's um, comfort zone in cities, I guess. So, you know, um, man's been fighting darkness since he, he lit the first fire, not he, since humankind has been fighting the darkness since they lit the first fire. There we go. All right. So the forecast casting ends November, November 15th, 2021 and resumes in 2022. I could not find a date. The website is, and Scott, put this on the chat, if you would, birdcast.info will take you to a wealth of this information, only a very, very thin slice of which I have shaved off to put into this uh, PowerPoint. There's a lot more data out there and a lot more information. Um, because this is just uber geeky and I love it. So um, it's amazing how we find ways, we humans, find ways to apply technology to different things you didn't think of. You know, it, it, it's just amazing that, in, you know, Next Rad came on in, in the 90s and everybody thought, wow, that's just amazing. 
and then dual pole radar came along that told us because dual pole has two different angles of radar at the same time. And because it's two different angles of radar, that allows them to use trigonometry to determine the size and shape of objects. And so just astounding what can be done. So we're going to end up with birds. Photo by Terry Stanfield. We talked about this bird a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the link is dead. But we all know what mallards sound like because we've seen them in parks. They go quack, 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 quack. And the male in the wintertime makes this sound. I should have been get my whistler ready. And you'll be, I've been out in the woods or in, in, the, in, in the swamp and ducks fly by and I do that. And it's astounding. They all turn and look trying to find where that duck is or where that stupid person is trying to sound like a duck one or the other, but it certainly gets their attention. So, you know, the, there is, this is a, uh, almost all green heads. There's a few females in there, a few hens. Uh, but this is, I had, I, I, I identified this as mallards in their arrow ecology. And I suspect this picture was taken at the Eco Watch Nature area in Gentry where Terry loved uh, to spend his time. So, um, you know, obviously you can see that the breeding ground is up in Canada uh, and they're here year round, which means they breed here as well. Uh, but there's not a lot of breeding mallards generally around here. There's a few, but those are generally in parks and places like that. Um, I've never been on a lake or in a swamp in the spring or summer where I saw what I thought were, where I saw, you know, green hands. I've seen them in the fall and winter, but generally they're gone in the, in the spring and summer, except for the ones that hang around in city parks. So. Got it. Uh, we have a question and a okay. comment here um, from Pekka. Pekka says, or asks, what birds, uh, what do birds do if there is a storm for say a couple of days? And then what do they do for food? Because they probably wouldn't be, uh, there probably wouldn't be any flies to catch. Well, they hunker down like the rest of us. If a big storm's coming, they get grounded. They hit the ground. And, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, their migration knowledge allows them to find and land in places that are suitable for them. I think that, you know, the, the, the Midwest is uh, the fields of the Midwest are, you know, in the, in the fall are full of, of spilled grain and waste grain. And I know states along the Mississippi River actually pay farmers to leave crops in the field, either standing or cut, specifically to feed migrating birds and specifically waterfowls in the, in the fall and winter. Uh, so, um, you know. Let me add something here. Yep. The uh, if, if you if you want to talk about songbirds, the majority of songbirds are not necessarily seed eaters or grain eaters. They actually eat insects, and so and also as as we all know, today is the first day of autumn, correct? Uh, no, first full day. First full day. First first full day. So you know we have it on a calendar. Birds have it in their heads. They know. They know, as I, I can tell you, two days ago, it was in the 50s, and I got up in the morning like 7 o'clock. The last two days, it's been like 41, 42. Every year at this time, we have a snap when it goes to the first day of fall. These birds have an idea that if it gets cold in Colorado, we know it's going to be cold as you go down south, but the, the, the birds that are, are eating insects have already left because most of those insects, mosquitoes and so forth, unless you're in Mississippi and Idaho and in, and in uh, Louisiana where all those hurricanes were, there's no mosquitoes around here. So all, yeah. all the, uh, all the uh, insect eaters are gone. So 
I can, I can. But there still is sex down in Texas, is what I'm getting at. They've already uh, uh, left, but they're probably in Texas now. I can tell you, I, the church yard I mow is at Acres. And probably three weeks ago, the fly catchers began and swallows began uh, ski daddling. You started seeing, you know, there was always, when I'm mowing, I'm stirring up bugs, right? And so there's always a couple of swallows, you know, doing the swallow barnstorming thing over your head. And there's always fly catchers sitting on a fence waiting for me to come by. And uh, uh, that ended about a month ago. So started, they, they just know, I think, you know, it has to do probably with the sun uh, as much as anything else. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of factors, but like you said, they know and they're going to survive. They're going to go yeah. where the, where their food is. And they just innately know the challenge to that is habitat destruction. Um, that's, that presents a huge challenge for birds as habitat destruction happens. You know, if the migrators rely on trees and all the trees get cut down, it makes it a challenge for those birds to do their thing. Um, you know, we are the use of insecticides in places in Central America and South America that devastates the, the, the future of migrating birds. Right. So these birds are relying on us for their preservation. You know, relying on well, us. No, no, it's, it's the other way around. Humans well, are relying on our own preservation. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That birds that's, still exist. That's, that's where I was going with that. Yeah. Because, <laughs> because they're relying on us not to kill the planet. You know, that's where I was going with that. Is yeah. relying on us to maintain habit, to cut the use of pesticides would not necessary, or the overuse of pesticides. Now, I'm not saying we have to get rid of all pesticides. You know, polio used to be endemic, not polio, malaria used to be endemic in the Southern United States. And it's not anymore. There's no endemic malaria in, in the United States. And it's attributed to one thing. And Scott, you and Dan are old enough to know what it was. What what was it? DDT. DDT. <clears throat> you know, so there's there's a new trick though. It's done with um, modifying the genetics of mosquitoes so that they can't reproduce. Yeah, but then they figure out a way because life has a way. The life does have a way. That's life, right. Life has a way. And that they, they, have, they, you know, even, even with, with um, pesticides, eventually life is going to find a way that pesticides won't work, you know? Well, so well, it's exactly, you know, methyl resistant resistance, Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA. You yeah. know, you can't treat it with penicillin because it went thumbed its nose at penicillin. You know, uh, life wants to exist. You know, it's like the single blade of grass you see in the sidewalk somewhere, you know. Yeah. That, that, that. We, we have a little tree pushing up right through the asphalt of our parking lot. Okay. Do we? Okay. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. we pay, we pay an area at the church and I've been fighting dandelions and, and uh, uh, Bermuda grass all summer long just growing up right through the asphalt. We want to think about asphalt as being some solid, you know, whatever, but when they scraped off the topsoil, they didn't get all the roots or the rhizome of a, of a dandelion. Mm -hmm. And by golly, it's growing through four inches of asphalt and bunk and comes and comes up. Fascinating. That's right. That's all right. right. So we have some more comments here. Okay. Uh, Norm Hughes says, man, when I lived in Arkansas, the bird migration was spectacular. The yeah. geese filled the sky for days. Pelicans were another big presence. So uh, ask Norm, ask Norm, where'd you live in Arkansas? You must have lived in either, probably East Arkansas, maybe South Arkansas somewhere. So uh, I'd love to know where you lived. Yeah. Book Davey says the migrations are really good in central Missouri too. Yeah. Pekka said, I have planned to contact ornithologists and wildlife associations on my fight against light pollution when the politicians don't cooperate with me. 
that's it's finding allies for your cause celebre, if you will, um, is certainly a way to achieve the goal that you want. You know, the goal you want is astronomy in Stockholm, Sweden, Pekka. The goal bird watchers want is to have good migrations of, of birds in Sweden. Um, you know, uh, there's people who love fireflies in the United States. Well, guess what? Light pollution affects the reproduction cycle of, of fireflies. And so we're all connected. You find allies who want the same thing for different reasons, and you ally everybody together, and you find strange bedfellows to work for a common cause. Apparently, I put in the wrong link here. Oh, it's birdcast.info. So sorry, guys. Um, I'll, I'll correct that here in a second. There's more comments, though. Harold Locke says that, uh, and I think he's responding to, uh, I think on that website, uh, it talked about 400 and some odd um, uh, million birds in that migratory path. Harold says it's a billion birds, billion plus birds, if those predictions are different birds. Um, let's see. Yeah, there are some there are some nights when they have they predict more than a billion birds. Yeah. And B Book Davy says we're part of the food chain. Might be the top of the food chain, but that just puts more pressure on us to make sure the rest of the chain stays intact. Yeah, because when all the lions eat all the wildebeest, the lions get hungry. And then what happens? Then you're a dead yeah. duck, Kent. Uh, you might be a dead lion. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's see. Harold Locke says, growing up in North Carolina and South Carolina, the parents would send us out to run in the smoky spray of the DDT. Uh, oh, yeah, my absolutely. God. <laughs> well, that's, Harold, that goes along with us in elementary school playing with uh, mercury. They would, the teacher just poured it in our hands. I think they were just trying to get rid of some of us. I don't know. You know. I grew up when the, when the bug killer went by in 1960, I was just learned to ride a bike when I was five. So in 1968, once a week, that thing came by and my brother and I, we were, we thought we were so brave driving in this cloud and hoping nobody would run into us in a car. That was our way of playing chicken with cars. And we're driving along in a cloud of DDT or whoever knows else knows what God and godly substance they were using in that to kill mosquitoes, but we did it. And, you know, the hot slide didn't burn my rear. I did fall off of the hot slide a number of times in the playground. I fell off the monkey bars, did not break myself, but you know, you just, it didn't kill me. Thank goodness. That's right. One thing I can say, Kent, is that humans are living longer. So, yeah. oh, by the way, have I shown you the arm that goes on? I've got in the middle of my back from from that. I got this. I try not to talk about it much because it doesn't move really well. But yeah, mm. that arm back there. So the extra arm. <laughs> yes. Extra arm. Okay. Yes. Any more questions coming in, Scott? Uh, and Martin says we used to spray DDT on the house door screens and pour cyanide down ant holes. <laughs> I've poured gasoline down ant holes and lit it off. That's quite fun. So, all right. So, <laughs> so we'll end up with a pretty picture of another flyer from Terry, uh, a zebra swallowtail. He did not name the plant that was on it, and you know, as we all know, I can't go ask him what it was. So, and I didn't uh, take the time to look it up. I don't have a wildflower book. I need to get one to identify. But that's just a beautiful uh, flyer that has its own arrow ecology. So, uh, sure. I don't see Sir? it. Huh? Are you showing it? I don't see it. I was. That. Hang on. I, I, un, I unshared you because we were oh. stuck on a slide for a very long time. Well, I'm going to I'm gonna reshare real quick. Okay. So you can see that beautiful wee thing. Oh, yeah. All right. So I'm not in presentation mode, but you can still see it. Yeah, that's good. It's good. Yeah, I went up to click stop share, and it was like, it's not there. Not there anymore. All right. So... So, you know, I'm talking about it now because, and, and we'll talk about it in the spring when they start to forecast again a little bit in one show, not go into the depth, but talk about it to remind people, you know, 
use it this fall, but get ready to use it this spring uh, to your advantage. Um, and go out and become a, a, a astronomical bird watcher. There or a bird watcher astronomer. Yeah. <laughs> and send me your pictures. I've got a few. I need some more pictures for another show. Looking for them. Send me your pictures of your birds uh, so I can do another reader submission. So uh, next send week, sir. Sir? Send them where? Where do you send them? Scott, where do we send them? Where do you send them? Explore Alliance at? ExploreScientific.com. ExploreScientific.com. So next episode, episode 15, is going to be migrators. So I'm going to dig around and find some pictures of birds that migrate and uh, go from there. So we'll have some pictures of migratory species uh, tomorrow. Or tomorrow. Seven, days from, seven days next week tomorrow. Norm is saying, he's, he said, not a bird, but I've been seeing tons of monarch butterflies last week mm -hmm. or so. They are everywhere. See, that's the crazy. You, you, the monarch butterflies that fly down to, the, to Mexico to roost in the very specific trees year after year are five or six generations removed from the monarch butterflies that left there in the spring of this year. And they go back to the same trees. That is just mind boggling. The size of a, of a monarch's butterfly brain is tiny wee little bitty. That information. Single, -celled, single minded brains. That, that information is transferred across generations yeah. to make it back to Mexico where there are five or six generations great left in the spring of 2021 mm -hmm. i am just blown away by the the grandeur of that simple thing you know the mysteries of nature the mysteries of nature miraculous, we'll never, yeah. we'll never miraculous. have all the answers it, it's never. miraculous it surely is yeah and yeah, well, we don't have we don't have the answers to something like that i mean uh, you know, we can call it uh, instinct. We can call it, um, uh, you know, something from, you know, you can say God did it. Gift okay? of God, you know, Mother Nature. You can say Mother Nature. Uh, but uh, I don't believe uh, I don't believe science yet has a, a clear explanation of kind of the mechanism for that. So it's yeah. um, it is it's pretty just amazing. It just it just blows me. That that is maybe one of the most miraculous things. That you know the fact that okay, I can see a butterfly flying up to Michigan and then flying back to the same trees. But the great 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 grand butterfly, uh, uh, mind boggling. So, Scott, somebody okay. saying something. I think Ooh. that's it, folks. All right. Yeah. Harold says it's the driving force of the universe. That's true. That's it. That's that it. That is true. That's okay. it. Okay. Y'all, let me tell you something about Scott real quick and the driving force of the universe. Scott's a vegetarian. Um, he's very uh, maybe Buddhist-like, if you will. And if a mosquito gets inside Barbara Jean... He will catch it. Barbara Jean is my airstream. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Jean, that sounded so weird. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm what did you just say? Turning She's red. If, if, a, if a mosquito gets in his airstream trailer, which he has named Barbara Jean after his beloved mother, yes. which makes it even worse what I just said. Um, if a mosquito gets inside of his arbitrary, he will catch it and release it outside. Yes. Because... Why kill it? There's yeah, why kill it? There's, if I there's, swat at it, he'll try to get away from me. You know, if it's you like think about trying to swat at anybody else, what is it? The theory know? that a butterfly can flap its wing and cause a hurricane in the Pacific Ocean? Yeah, it's all connected. That that mosquito might be the one mosquito that keeps a purple martin alive to or a bat alive tonight. <laughs> to have babies tomorrow. If you kill it, you've 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 kept a 
Oh. A, a dragonfly or a or a bat from eating that mosquito because you that can't could... kill you can't i mean unless unless we're going to drop a ddt bomb or something you can't kill all the mosquitoes and nor have we been able to do it okay we've tried you know, you know um that's like i hear commercial on the radio you know spray kent's magic formula on your your yard kills more than 100 kinds of bugs and i'm thinking those bugs aren't hurting me. In fact, those bugs are are fireflies and roly polies and grasshoppers. Which, which grasshoppers, by the way, roly polies taste like shrimp. I might know firsthand. Maybe oh, shrimps yeah. are the roly poly of the sea. And and black ants taste like lemon drops. There you go. So, and I want my lemon drops without poison on them. So I do not poison my yard. Because I like having. I, I'll tell you something about Kent. I actually watched Kent eat a grub worm one time. So, Kent does eat the insects. Yep. But, you know, <laughs> Dan is like <laughs> staring in disbelief. <laughs> it's just a grub. Well, we're going to end the show with this with this little message. <laughs> what the message is, I'm not sure. But uh, we're all. I'm crazy. I'm. <laughs> But thank you very much for watching, and uh, we'll be back on next week with more on the wing. Bye, thank everybody. You. Thanks. A KQED HD production. This is pretty cool. Everybody stay around and watch this. Don't go. Watch this. It starts with a distant call, an ancient song heard through the rising mist, announcing the changing of the seasons. For thousands of years and countless generations, they have flown this path, arriving, then departing, providing a rhythmic pulse to the natural world. People's connection with birds and their migrations goes back thousands of years. Aristotle commented on that, and they speculated on bird migrations. They definitely use uh, bird migration as a timer for their seasons. The robins showing up in your backyard and singing, the geese that show up in the fall. Today, scientists working in California's Central Valley are finding important links between bird migration and global changes, both natural and man-made. Understanding how birds use their environment and the routes they fly will help conservationists preserve and protect habitat. The information that we're getting from uh, understanding bird migration is a really powerful tool for us from an applied conservation perspective. Some of these birds are going from one end of the globe to the other, and we, we have limited conservation funds, limited resources, and so it allows us really to hone in on the key sites that are important to different migratory animals and to dedicate our resources to, to those priority areas. It's long been known that migrating birds follow the wings of their ancestors and use the same age-old flight paths. Scientists call these well-traveled routes flyways. The whole flyway concept was developed in the 1930s by a guy, Frederick Lincoln, who he was looking at band recoveries of waterfowl, ducks and geese, and, uh, and he found that birds were using these predictable corridors through the United States. And, he defined four corridors, which he called flyways, the Pacific, the Central and Mississippi flyways, and then the Atlantic flyway. Up to 13 different flyways have been identified around the world. The Pacific flyway runs from the Arctic Circle to the tip of South America. Millions of birds from more than 300 different species make an annual journey up and down the Pacific Corridor, taking advantage of the best habitat conditions for breeding and foraging for food. 
The flyway in and of itself is a really interesting thing from an evolutionary perspective. You might wonder why birds would travel such long distances. And it turns out it's actually more energy efficient. They migrate up to the north to capture the longer hours during the northern summer. So because it's daylight for a much longer period, they're able to forage for a longer period. And that helps them to be more successful in nesting and also having larger numbers of eggs that successfully hatch. And as those conditions change and the day length shortens, they migrate back down to the southern regions that are more hospitable to overwinter. No two species follow the same exact route. Some fly thousands of miles, some just a short distance, many crossing paths in the San Francisco Bay and the Delta. This is essential habitat for these long distance travelers. For some birds, it's their final destination. For others, a crucial rest stop as they make the trek further south. You might even call the San Francisco Bay Area the Grand Central Station for birds on the Pacific Flyway. It's really the meeting point for so many different bird species. We have your waterfowl that come down from the north. We have smaller species like songbirds. We have raptors that fly through. And it's really just such a great mixing bowl for all of these different species. How birds navigate is still somewhat of a mystery. Some are genetically hardwired. Many use the sun, the stars, <coughs> and landscape to guide them, while others are in tune with the Earth's magnetic poles. We don't fully understand how birds migrate and what might be their triggers for landing in the exact same place year to year, but it is true that you can put up a net in the same place year to year and catch the same identical bird. Biologist Cheryl Strong and her team from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are banding songbirds at the Don Edwards Wildlife Refuge near Newark, California. So this guy's band is 01701. Once they're banded, if they're recaptured somewhere else, then you get a lot of information about the movement of those birds. You can also get information on survival and lifespan of those birds and also behavior of the birds. Joe has a hermit thrush, which is a bird that winters here. It's actually really rare to know exactly where the same population of birds winters and also breeds. So if you can get that kind of information, it's really valuable to see. If you have a declining species, um, such as a songbird or even a duck, if you know what the threats are to that bird, uh, in either on its breeding grounds or on its wintering grounds, then you can better help conserve that bird. And there he goes. Biologists are now concerned with reports that the majority of migrating songbird species are suffering population declines. Another report by the U.S. Department of Interior indicates half of America's migrating coastal shorebird species are in decline. While population numbers of waterfowl vary from year to year, many species of ducks and geese are faring better. Birds face many threats along the Pacific Flyway, from pollution to habitat loss. <laughs> to get a more comprehensive view of exactly where the birds go and what they face on their migration, scientists are employing sophisticated radio and satellite tracking devices. There's several ways you can track a migratory bird. One way is using a satellite transmitters, which this is a 12 gram satellite transmitter that attaches to a bird's back. Powered by a solar cell, the device can send information via satellite for months, even years, providing scientists a way to actively follow individual birds. Last summer, biologists trapped and satellite tagged long-billed curlews on their nesting grounds in the prairies of Montana. Well, the long-billed curlew is the largest shorebird in North America. And it breeds in the prairies and in the Great Basin. And then it migrates 600 to 1,200 miles south. And a lot of them come to the Central Valley of California. 
And we became very interested in how important is the Central Valley for the wintering long-billed curlews. We found the curlews very dependent on agricultural lands, and particularly they like alfalfa. Biologists released the curlews in Montana and have tracked them as they've traveled down to their winter home west of Sacramento. We've had about 10 long-billed curlews in the valley that we've monitored over the past three years. And we found, interestingly, they're very sight faithful from one year to the next. There's concern about the curlews because they're so dependent on man-made habitats much more than a lot of other species. Changes in habitat or climate can impact and disrupt the rhythm of migration. In 2009, a National Audubon Society study found that more than 150 species of migratory birds are wintering further north than they were 40 years ago. There's a lot of talk lately about migration phenology, which is basically the timing of migration based on what's happening in the environment, and the, the chance that that will change because of climate change. So the cues that birds use to migrate are changing, and it might make them migrate too soon or too late. And the danger is uh, that they could arrive to the breeding ground at the wrong time. Migratory birds are the proverbial canary in the coal mine, a warning signal of the failing health of our ecosystems. Small shifts in their patterns are telling us that the rhythm of the natural world is changing, and those environmental changes will affect all life on this planet. I think it's valuable to study birds. They're one of the best interfaces between man and the environment the real ability of birds and all the different things they do needs to be appreciated by the public so they want to conserve them. The reason I study birds is because I want to preserve the beauty of the earth. Thank you.